One of the reasons why I enjoy making video reviews so much is that it also gives me an opportunity on top of sharing my ideas with you, uh, which is fun, uh, to try games that otherwise may, I may not even uh, know about, uh, which is what happened here with Renaissance Wars. Uh, this game that I heard absolutely nothing about one day showed up on my doorstep all, by, all alone, all by itself, in a generic box that was shipped to me. Uh, I don't know about whom. I assume the, the publisher, I assume uh, this is a review copy. Uh, if that's not the case, like you ordered the game and you have a name like Mark Arnaudi or something like that, well, let me know, maybe this is your copy. I assume it's a review copy that was sent to me. So I played it and I'm reviewing it right now. See, I see a game I played. That's the kind, of, kind of crazy person that I am. Renaissance Wars is a card game inspired by the Renaissance. It has a lot of flavor, a lot of flavor text there, a lot of attempts to capture the Renaissance spirit. But in essence, it is a card game uh, that relies on a trick taking engine. So it's a trick taking game with a renaissance theme uh, but there's a lot that has been built around the basic trick taking uh, idea uh, to try to flesh out the theme. So it's a pretty complex and pretty long game. It's not gonna be your your simple 10-20 minutes game that you play with, with your old aunt when she comes to visit. Let me show you how the game works. In this game, each player plays the role of a pivotal figure of the period of the Renaissance. Or maybe you should say, you play the role of a system of cultural forces around that figure. You can roleplay it and really believe in, in the game. You're William Shakespeare or Brunelleschi, Francis Bacon, maybe you Ignatius of Loyola. You can be Luther, Martin Luther, there is a variety of character. Uh, each each player will have a playmat such as this one with a little bit of historical information about the figure here, special powers, superpowers granted to each character. Uh, so that will add a little bit of theme and also will make the game less symmetrical because different players will have different powers. So here you have a very good summary of play. Uh, an area where you play the captured cards, and then here you will place a personal action in each round of the game. You will receive a card from this deck of personal actions. You will put it here face down, you look at it, other people won't see it, and then you will play it when it applies. These personal actions will give you special benefits, so when you apply it and what the card does depends on the effect described on the card itself and you will get a new one at the end of each turn, so if you don't use it, you lose it. Populous card. During the game you may also acquire populous cards. They come out of the regular deck, which we will look at in a second. When you do receive them, because you capture them during the game, you place them here. You can have up to two at a time. And again, you follow the instructions. At the end of each uh, combat round, maybe you should call it that way, um, you simply follow the instructor for each populous card that you have, and many of these cards will make you roll dice a lot. This is a game that uses d4s. How often do you see d4s outside of role-playing games? So you roll a d4, if that is what your populous card instructs you to do, and you follow the instructions. A lot of these cards do have random effects, uh, so you figure out what the pirate does for you, the drunkard does for you, and so on and so forth. This is for the player mat. As you said, there is a main deck of cards, but let's talk actually about the special cards still. You also have two other decks of cards, the immediate intrusion and immediate event. So the immediate thing already tells you um, pretty much what they are. These are random events. Uh, there are two that will be used in each from each deck that will be used in each era. The game is divided in four eras and there are these very cute envelopes where you place the cards for the era. So before the game you place here the immediate intrusions and events that you will use in era, in era two. Then when it is the time you take them out looking very serious and you add them to the main deck. They're cute, but I don't really know that we need them because, well, we could just have two decks and at the end of each era you draw the cards that you need for the following year and you shuffle them in the main deck. Again, also here you have some special cards which also will be part of the main deck, they have special effects. 
But these are the main cards. They are identified by a color stripe here, which indicates in the game is called the condition. I don't particularly like that name. It's pretty much the suit that is really what matters. So you have the suit or condition, then you have a numerical value and a symbol here. Most of what you have here is just flavor text of the figure or the event represented by the card. Some cards do have special powers, for example the luminaries, they have the symbol here. They are the same characters as the ones that the players may may play and if you find yourself there is a special uh, effect that you can implement that is each card or each player gets a special effect implemented when you're playing your own there's a special effect on your mat that is triggered by your own card which is somewhere lost in the deck in any case all luminaries even if you get one that is not specifically yours have again special effects that can be used at specific times each player receives a hand of cards at the beginning of each main big round and well then uh, you need to determine which is the dominant condition. Of the suits there are four that can be dominant, so one of them can be dominant at a time. Suppose at the beginning of the game culture is dominant, there are game effects that may change the dominant condition and also the main condition will change at the end of a, of a round. So a round is pretty much made of a series of encounters, we should think of those as turns, and at the end there is a mega event which is called the battle. Each encounter is divided in a skirmish phase where people quote-unquote have small fights and they steal cards from one another, and then you also have a phase after the skirmish where the winner of the skirmish can, uh, can do extra actions. So basically, this is pretty much how it works. Uh, skirmish, everybody plays cards and you determine who wants that skirmish. Winner of the skirmish can perform uh, extra events, everybody draws a card, you repeat until the deck is exhausted. When the deck is exhausted, then you have that other phase, which is the battle. When the battle is resolved, you are done with that round and you count the points based on money that you acquired. You advance on this track here. Uh, basically, this represents the money to deposit in the bank. You deposit 300 florins, then you move your Shakespeare guy there. Later, at the end of the next round, you deposit 400 more, you move there. And when you cross those lines is when you trigger New Year's. The winner is the player the first gets to get to 1637, or the first player basically to deposit 1637 florins exactly, it doesn't have to be exactly. Uh, again, the, the number here represents a date, again with a symbolic flavor, historical value. But this is the main idea. Uh, skirmishes, events, uh, repeat until end of the deck, big battle, deposit money, and repeat until a player wins. Now, as for the skirmishes, uh, this, the skirmishes pretty much are a standard, fairly standard, say, uh, trick-taking game. The player that has the initiative, that goes first, uh, plays a card, and that determines the lead suit. Now, if everybody else has to play a card from their hand, they do not have to follow suit, but if they don't, in most cases, the card that they play is completely useless. Because, uh, well, let's see, for example, that we have another player here, say Jackie plays that card, and here we have a player, we'll call him Will, and Will plays this other card. Now, the lead suit is the blue, is the politics, and when everybody plays their cards in the skirmish, the winner of the skirmish is the player that has the highest value in the lead suit, the first card that was played. If it is a card that doesn't have a suit, for example, a special card, then the next card that is played that will have a suit uh, is the one that determines the, the lead suit. In this case, here you have a 15 in the lead suit, then Will wins this skirmish. It is a tie, then the first card that was played is the winning one. Now, Will gets these cards captured, puts them in his personal pile of capture cards. Now he can perform some special actions and then he will start the new skirmish by playing another card, uh, well, no, we're going to defense, and say, now he plays this card here, and now this is the lead suit. 
as I said, uh, the lead suit is the one that wins. Well, suppose actually plays this. It's supposed to wins. The highest in the lead suit is the is the one that wins, unless cards in the dominant, which is the trump suit, are played. Then in that case, it doesn't matter. Uh, the number, there's only one trump card that was played in a skirmish that one wins. For example, here the lead suit is religion and there's a value of 15 and we have only a 10 but is in the culture which is the dominant so the 10 wins over everything else. And if there are multiple cards in the dominant condition in the trump suit then the highest one wins. There are a couple of other twists based on other special cards, but this is the generic, the general idea. Also, there are certain situations that will put unwanted cards in your hand. As you can see, they don't have a suit, the value is meh. It's pretty annoying. There are certain situations in which you'll get them, and then maybe you'll manage to stick them in somebody else's pile. That's also interesting, because of uh, game actions and special effects. So you repeat like this until uh, all pl the deck is depleted. But after you win the skirmish is when you can do cool stuff, which is when you can put down a meld. For each uh, skirmish that you win, you can put down a meld from your hand. So you're trying to get a good combo of cards in your hand that both allows you to win skirmishes and also to put down melds. The value of the melds is indicated here. It seems like a lot to take, but in reality, the counterintuitive ones with the ones that require a little more work are these ones you need to have this sequence here from the dominant condition and that pays a lot of florins which you cash in immediately you uh and these are all pokers pretty much four of a kind from different conditions so same symbol from different conditions each set of four pays uh, something and gives that amount of money and you put the meld in front of you and that is it also you have the royal marriage so if you have a queen and a king from the dominant condition it's good and king and queen from the non-dominant condition that is good too also, if you uh, break uh, the wall of separation between state and church, this is the Renaissance, you know, um, they didn't have Thomas Jefferson yet. So if you break that wall by marrying, ideally, the king of politics and the bishop of religion, you also get some money. Also, if you play your own luminary card, that also gives you some money. So you put down the melds like in any trick-taking game. You form your thing. What is interesting is that you can also add to previous melds of your own. So, for example, uh, if I have a meld here, which is, say, four kings. Okay, I have the four kings here. And later I get a queen of one of my kings. I can marry her to one of the kings. So I simply put it by the king in the meld. Basically, I would have an intersection here. So I have the four kings here. This is the king of religion. Then I put this one here. I've added to my previous meld. And now I'm using both cards to have a marriage. And maybe later then I have a meld of queens that will include her. So you can ramif build ramifications around your melds. You can even actually play cards directly from your meld into a skirmish then you're breaking the meld uh, and you cannot rebuild it uh, just uh, as it was you can take out a queen and then add a queen to rebuild your meld and get it to pay off again but if you have a meld of four queens and you're playing one then you can still marry any of those to create a meld with uh, and to meet one of the marriages conditions to cash in from there this is the main thing, really, is the most important thing that happens when you win a skirmish, that you get a chance of putting down a meld. There are also other things that you can do because there are special events, uh, actions, for example, that are triggered when you win a skirmish. Repeat like this, as I said, until uh, the uh, deck is exhausted. At that point, uh, uh, you do a couple of procedures uh, simply to to upkeep the game and then you start the battle during the battle Everybody picks up their cards that they still have, that they have in their melts This is interesting the cards that they have in the melts remember you can play them into skirmish the cards that you have in your melt is counterintuitive in your melts as counterintuitive as it sounds are still part of your hand so at the end you scoop them up you add them to your hand and now you have your hand for the battle the battle is pretty much, um, I'm not going to get into details, but to give you the general sense, it's like a mega skirmish, in which a player plays a card, 
And the difference between the regular skirmishes is that you have to try to win the, the each round of the battle. In regular skirmishes, I may save some of my cards to build melts or to do whatever other strange tricks I have in mind. Here, you have to try to win. So, if a player starts a battle with this card and I have this card in my hand and this is the only blue card that I have, I have to play it. So you have to try to win. So if you have cards of the lead suit for that round of battle, you have to play them. If you don't have them, but you do have the trump cards, then the trump suit, then you have to try to trump it. You have to try to win it. Once the battle is over, then everybody will have decks of cards that have been captured during the battle. And at that point, you total all of the money that you have, you total all of the points that come from the cards that you have captured uh, during the battle and during the previous skirmishes. So you total all of those points, this is the value of the cards that have been captured, is the same as the quote unquote battle value or, or uh, skirmish value. You total all of that florins from these cards, florins from your personal pile, they have their fun play money, and then you deposit it to the bank. You deposit as much as you can until you have less than a hundred in your pile. So for example, if at the end of a round uh, I have a 230, then I keep the 30, I deposit the 200, I move by 200, by 200 and that's it. Which is good because it tells me where I am in the game and also uh, it, once it's in the bank it cannot be touched. Uh, game effects cannot take it from me because there are a lot of those annoying game effects that allow you to tax other players, to force them to pay you money, etc, etc, etc. First player, after several rounds uh, and four eras, first player to gain enough money, the four points, to get to that point in the track is the winner of the game. So it's a pretty meaty game, uh, but I like the fact that, it, that the meat all uh, is around this very lean, very agile skeleton of the trick-taking game. You're building melts, everybody plays poker, everybody knows what how to put four cards of the same type together. Everybody knows the trick-taking idea that um, the highest card within a suit wins unless it is uh, there is a card from the Trump suit around. Basic, clean, simple. But then you have all of these other game effects that come into play that really make the game complex um, and rewarding. And actually there are basically really these three uh, angles that come together, three perspectives that you have to take into account. You're building the melts and you're trying to win skirmishes and you're trying to think ahead about the battle. This last step is the one that you'll figure out last because first you need to react during the skirmish phase, uh, win the skirmish, build a mail, build, build the skirmish. And the first battle or two you'll get in pretty much just random. What you have there is what you have there. Then you'll start once the previous part becomes more automatic then you'll start uh, to plan towards it and that is when all elements of the game fit together and the game becomes truly rewarding but uh, it takes a while it's a game that will feel a lot it will feel very procedural uh, cumbersome clunky awkward almost for the first couple of rounds, um, players are reading all the rules and the exceptions and becoming familiar with all of the uh, specific effects, trying to figure them out. After a while, things become uh, automatic, the game picks up speed, the pace uh, starts, become, starts, starts being um, much more enjoyable and the game is in fact pretty enjoyable. I definitely enjoyed it. Uh, two minor things maybe, one is that Especially with new players, the game may last quite a bit. Again, with experienced gamers that know what they're doing, experienced players that uh, are familiar with the game and the, the game effects and the combos, uh, then the game won't overstay its welcome. The first game, maybe you can play a shorter version. Actually, there is no rule. Well, there is a rule, but you can break it. There is no rule written in stone that says that you have to play until 1637. What I like about this game is that, in fact, you can shorten it as much as you want. If you want to play three eras, 
be my guest. I won't sue you for that. So if you find that the game, especially maybe with new players, uh, with gamers that are not stronger, sort of like you know, casual gamers, you want to shorten it a little bit, then the game allows you to do so without any particular peril to the integrity of the design. So uh, I like that. The, the, one of the minor things is that it may last quite a bit, but it's easily solved. Uh, another thing that I'm not completely solved on is the populous cards. I showed them to you, those are the ones that uh, have an effect that is triggered very often. It can, to me, it, it seems silly a little bit to have to roll a die many, many times and in one turn the effect is that they give you five coins. Then I roll again next turn and you give me 10 coins. Then I roll again, you give me five coins. Then I roll again, I give you 20 coins. There's all these transactional small amounts of money that go on the table, I give them to you, you give them back to me. Uh, it seems to me there's a lot of rolls for what at the end is maybe a difference of like 30, 40 tops. Uh, Florence, but most likely with all the times that you give money and you get money, it's probably going to be around 20 or so. Um, it just seemed to me could have been much more economic in the populous card, so they figured out more or less what the average is going to be after rolling for the effects a lot of times. So the final average would be, and they just uh, describe that as an effect that is triggered only once in the game. I think it would make the, the thing easier. On the other hand, uh, there are also players that they played it with that really enjoyed that because they found it fun, and they find that it brings some theme that the drunkard has, has won a game of cards one turn and so has brought some money home, and the following one, the following turn actually has a lot of money. One of the cards is the baby, uh, you have been blessed with a bundle of joy that is not going to cost a lot of money and you're trying to get the baby to be adopted by somebody else. So it's kind of like fun and people laugh when this, oh, there you go, um, when this baby is going around. Uh, the theme that comes from the populous card is fun and funny. Uh, the procedure could have been resolved more elegantly, I believe, I believe. Um, but there is, again, a trade-off there. In general, these are minor quibbles that uh, do not detract from the overall experience of playing the game. Overall, this is a game that I enjoyed. Um, Trick-taking games are not the first type of game that comes to mind if I'm thinking about my favorite mechanics, but here this very basic linear idea has been combined with a, a solid theme with very beautiful components, absolutely top-notch components, nice looking, a lot of interesting beautiful art. The art is art, like traditional Renaissance art. Uh, so you have beautiful illustrations, interesting text, uh, sturdy box. Component-wise, this is a solid design. Design-wise, this is a solid design. I should say component-wise, this is a solid game. But solid game and solid design. Fun, um, not for the most casual gamer, but definitely not like a heavyweight game. Sort of like metal, little more than casual, mid-weight game with a very single, simple engine, but a lot of other effects in games and rules and procedures that add more complexity, challenge, and strategy. Renaissance Wars, definitely a fun card game.